Good morning. It is a beautiful morning, isn't it? And I want to remind you it's October now, so we should be especially grateful for every morning like this. Um, it's been a strange fall, a fall already. I heard that um, the Nebraska football game yesterday, it was 97 degrees at kickoff, and that's crazy. So, But we are here to worship our God, and I want to um, thank you for coming, welcome you here to this place. It's going to be an exciting morning. We're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper. Also glad to have Joe Torin here, and wait, Katie, is that right? Al yeah, Alex, that's a lot like Katie, right? Um, but uh, Joe is uh, a son of this church, and he is in ministry at the University of Indiana, Kokomo, I believe. No, that's right. Okay, I got one right. So um, we are here ultimately, though, to worship our God. I, am, I do want to make a couple announcements, and then we will greet each other. A couple announcements I want you to know. Number one, we had our blood drive, and um, we had th 23 units of blood given this week. And um, I want to thank those of you that were here. Um, our next blood drive will be April 5th, and I encourage you to be there. And, you know, even if you have never given blood or that terrifies you, I want to continue to challenge you to consider how you can bleed for others because it saves lives. I mean, just straight up saves lives. Also, coming up, we have the apple pie sale, and uh, it raises money for missions. The order sheets um, and the sign-up sheet for working are on the welcome counter, and we want to encourage you to talk to your family and friends to be part of that and to buy some of those um, apple pies. And again, because the blood drive's over, and so Lorna doesn't know what to do with her time, she is heading up the um, apple pie sale. So that's the third thing is um, thank Lorna for all the work that she does on those kinds of things. All right, and uh, the other announcement I want to make, um, a couple of more. One is that um, two weeks from yesterday, I believe, is a trivia night for the Blummers. Dave and Ashley, who are um, adopting a girl from um, Latin America, and um, that's going to cost them a really high amount of money, and there's going to be a fun trivia night uh, on the 19th, is that? Is that the right math? Um, and I would encourage you to be part of that. And if you want to know more, talk to me, and we'll let you know about that. And finally, uh, on the, the last week in October, we are celebrating our 175th anniversary. On Saturday, there's going to be a 4 o'clock social hour back here. And then at 5 o'clock, we're going to have the dinner in the gym. And I am praying that we will, at one moment that evening, feel like, where are we going to put everybody? Okay? That's our prayer. To celebrate what God has done and also to look forward to what God is going to do. Now that Sunday morning is also going to be special. And so I would encourage you, even if you have somebody that can't come on Saturday night, um, I would encourage you to invite them to be here on Sunday morning um, as we celebrate, again, what God has done and what God is going to do. But before we do any of that, I want to encourage you to stand up. Let's shake some hands. Let's greet some people because God is here and he's called us to worship as a family.
Huh? How was the uh, soccer tournament yesterday? <laughs> Uh huh. against Calvin or
Psalm 28, 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song, I praise him. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this morning we can seek after your face together. We thank you, God, for Christ, the solid rock, our firm foundation. We thank you, God, that you are fully trustworthy because you are always faithful. You are always full of compassion. 
You are always leading and guiding. In the hard times, God, we thank you that we can look to you for all that we need. We thank you for the assurance that Jesus is ours because you call us your children. You've turned us towards you. You draw us closer to you in each moment in ways that we're understanding, in ways that we have no idea what's going on, God. We thank you that you are in control, that you are sovereign, that you have plans and purposes, even in the hard stuff. Please, God, increase our trust, increase our faith. And thank you that we can worship you and experience you together this morning. Amen. We have a new song we're sharing this morning, and we hope that you pick it up quickly. It's called All Sufficient Merit. So that's the title. It's like a big title. And there are a lot of fantastic words in here. So listen and sing when you're able.
we are taking our love offering uh, to support Joe and his ministry with CCO. So uh, last week we caught a little bit of a video from CCO to hear a little bit about their ministry as a whole. And uh, Joe wasn't able to be with us that week, but he graciously offered to come this Sunday and uh, share a couple minutes with us uh, about what he's doing in Kokomo and his work with the college students there. Joe? Thanks, Mark. Hello, people. Let's go in church family. You guys doing all right? I met some blasts from the past a little bit ago. Man, I still remember good old Jim Meadema driving that bus in the hills of West Virginia, man. That were the days. You remember those good times? That's right. Keeping us from going over the edge. Anyway, I am super thankful, and uh, Mark said it was a grace for me to be here. It is a grace um, for me to just see you guys and be back with uh, more of my church family. Um, yeah, I'm in Kokomo, Indiana. It's hard to believe I've been there 20 years. It's just, although my wife reminds me because we got to Kokomo um, the same year we got married. So I have to keep that in mind. And we're doing a little cruise here for my 20th anniversary coming up. So that's exciting. Anyway, um, the CCO in Kokomo, I kind of backed into it, but I really like what I get to do. I love being with college students and it's just continues to blow my mind. Anyway, the things uh, that you saw in the video last week, in the middle, middle of the video, some students start saying, and into my life walked Herb, or I don't remember the other two people that walked into their life, but I'm like, that is exactly what I do. Into, a student at IUK would say, into my life walked Joe. And that's kind of how it goes. Um, these days, I have the privilege of introducing students. Um, we, do, we do three things that we'd like to cover. The first one is we want to introduce students to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second thing is we want the, to prepare them to understand and be part of a church by the time they graduate. And the third part is we want them to understand a vision for their life, that God matters in all things. And it is my privilege to introduce them to those things. Um, I've been doing it for a little while now, about, actually January is going to be 10 years of uh, college ministry, oh my goodness. Anyway, um, so for 10 years I've been doing this and God continues to bless. Uh, last Sunday I could not be here because I and 19 other students uh, actually did the service at uh, First Evangelical Presbyterian Church. You guys know long names of churches, right? Yeah. So uh, we had the privilege of uh, all the students having part in the liturgy and parts of the sermon and things like that. I still remember back in, you know, back in the day, uh, uh, in, uh, we'd have a children's Sunday that children got to lead in worship, and that was a really neat experience. Um, so this, just this week, a couple of stories that came to mind was on, on Sunday, just before we're getting ready to go up and, and do the service, I get a text message from the track and cross country coach. And it says, Joe, would you be willing to meet with a uh, Christian school recruit this coming Monday? And I went, Lord, why is IUK calling me on Sunday morning? I was just really surprised that over the years I've gained, I've had intentional relationships so that IUK now calls me when they have students that they want to be part of their university to come and meet with them. And I was like, wow, that's a long way, Lord. Thank you. And then on Tuesday, I'm walking out of the fitness center, and I see this guy I just met the week before. And I said, hey, how are you doing? He says, I'm doing pretty good. You should walk with me. I said, okay, I guess so. So I'm walking with him through the parking lot, and he says, you know what? Two days ago, I gave my life to Jesus Christ for the first time. I said, what? Okay. He's like, I met you, and God had other kinds of pressures on me, and I was like, I just had to give my life to Jesus. And I was like, okay, God does things, and I'm just in the area. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not like right there. It's just like happening. And I'm so thankful for what God continues to do there. I will say, though, friends, I do wish that when I was younger, 
you guys had taught me a little bit more about this guy, Abraham Kuyper, okay? Because Abraham Kuyper and this other guy, Herman Deweyveard, they're cool Dutch Calvinist people, and they teach all kinds of good stuff that I've been learning with the CCO, and my, it's just amazing. Um, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, right? Okay, pastor, you got to teach them about all this stuff, okay? Make sure they know. Anyway, the CCO stands for the Coalition for Christian Outreach. And um, while it is a big tent organization, its roots are Reformed and Anglican. So it's a place where because of my upbringing here, I feel at home to bring the gospel with them to my campus in Kokomo, Indiana. Hey, thanks for your time. I'm going to be out back uh, near the baker's table. I don't know what to call it, uh, but it's got some food on it. Uh, if you would like to remember us and keep us in prayers, uh, there are some cool little magnets over there and some pens, and you can check those out on your way out. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I have no idea who's up next, but I can keep preaching if you want. We'll just open to Acts 17. I really like that part where he goes to the Areopagus to check that out. Is somebody going to take this from me, or I can just keep going? So, Pastor. Oh, thank you. I should say one more thing, though. Um, this past um, January, uh, we, no, nah, come on up. You're all right. I'm going to talk about you. This past January, um, my, my mom, Jenny Torn, passed away. Uh, well, it was actually December, but um, both Mark Scott and Pastor Mark came out. Uh, Mark to Kokomo and Pastor Mark uh, here to the cemetery uh, in, where were we, Oak Lawn or something like that? I don't remember. Somewhere over there. It was cold. It's much warmer now, like he said. But I'm just thankful for the continued ministry of this church to my heart and uh, to my, in my grief. So I really appreciate you guys. What do you want me to do with the microphone? Um, give it to Mark? Can, uh, yeah. <laughs> give it to Mark. Okay, we'll do that. Thank you so much. to build oh it's not it's on is it on it is okay um, we have had the opportunity to build relationships with people like Joe Torin who grew up as part of this church and Dan Evans I guess the ongoing thing is that we like fairly tall, bearded men who um, are doing ministry. And I hope that's exciting to you, to be part of a church that has ministry not just here on Sunday mornings, not just in this community, but I was talking yesterday to Brian Blummer, who grew up in this church. And he was talking about, he had a conversation recently with Roberto, who came to know the Lord in this church. And Roberto is actually has, is leaving his church in DeMott. He's going to be a chaplain in the military. And I don't know if you've heard that, but that's exciting to know that God is raising people up and using them in other situations. So um, that's one of the things we want to celebrate. And we want to continue to pray that um, he will do that. Is this, my wife is making hand signals at me. Is it not? Um, okay. Um, there, is that better? Terry can hear me, so we're, we're fine. Um, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in Kokomo. We thank you for how you raise up children who grow to adults and you shape them and mo model them and, and, and make them into what you want them to be. And then, Lord, you use them for your glory, for the advancement of your kingdom, Lord. We thank you for those mission trips in West Virginia um, decades ago and how you used that 
in a young man's life. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to work in Job's life. We pray that you would work through him. We pray, Lord, that there would continue to be young people who maybe know you, but they need to be discipled or even young people who don't know you, but hear the gospel and come to know the Savior, Lord. We pray that you would continue to do that. And we thank you, Lord, that sometimes we get to be part of that. Lord, we want to continue to pray for the ministry of this church that you would use us not just on Sunday mornings. Lord, we confess that sometimes as a church we tend to think that really it's about um, what happens at 9.30 on Sunday mornings. But Lord, we know and we believe that what we do this morning is just a launching pad for us to go out and to live for you, to be people, people of prayer and people of witness and people of love and people of service. Lord, we pray that you would send us out that we would serve in your name. Lord, we want to continue to pray for our upcoming anniversary. We want to pray for people who need prayer, especially this morning. We want to pray for Hank Elgersma as he recovers from his surgery, Lord. We pray for Hank and Cheryl Lanting, Lord, that you would continue to watch over them. And Lord, we, we pray for Beth Elgersma as well, Lord. We need you and we know that you understand what's going on even when we don't. Lord, we look out at our world and we see what's going on in Israel and Gaza and Lebanon and Ukraine and Haiti and the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Lord, we are aware that our world is broken and that there are people dying and suffering and there are people even in peaceful areas who don't know you. Lord, we pray that you would work through your church. Lord, give us a passion, a, a burning passion, not just to know you and walk with you, but also to serve you, to be used for your glory. Lord, we, we need you. And we ask you now to speak through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 19. Now, I'm going to read this, and then I want us to step back. Um, and if, if you are at all a Bible flipper, I want to encourage you to have your Bible open as we study this text. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful that for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? That's interesting wording, isn't it? Some Pharisees, um, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united for his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. 
But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between them, husband and wife, it is better not to marry. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it had been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Then Jesus, then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them, but the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. Lord, speak to us through your word. Teach us and shape us. In Jesus' name, amen. As I mentioned last week, this is one of those passages that kind of brings up a difficult, challenging concept. It's one of those things that if I wasn't preaching through it, I might not find my way to wrestle with the issue of divorce. But that's a major issue in our society. And I want us to make a few agreements up front. And I think we can all agree with these things. Number one, one of the deepest causes of relational and emotional pain in our world is divorce. Isn't that true? That one of the things that causes relational and emotional pain is divorce. Regardless of how you feel about that, regardless of your own experiences, we know that that causes a lot of pain. Anybody nod? Have you seen that? Yeah. Number two, a lot of people's view of divorce either lacks compassion for people who are struggling. You know, we say kind of legalistically, just don't do it. Either we lack compassion or sometimes we treat marriage too casually, right? As something that can be kind of easily disposed of. We, we agree with that, that sometimes we end up on either, are you awake today? I, I don't, our head nods too, okay. Um, Number three, the church hasn't always handled this issue very well. We have swung back and forth between, I think, three things. Either hard-hearted legalism like, hey, tough, you blew it, you got divorced. You know, there have been situations where um, I met somebody once who said they were in a church for 30 years, and they were never allowed to come to the table because when they were not even yet a Christian, they had, they had gotten divorced. And even in the grace of Jesus, they were in that church never allowed to take communion because they were divorced. That's hard. Either we have hard-hearted legalism or sometimes we have kind of a passive conformity to society, right? Well, that's the world we live in. And I think that as believers, that doesn't feel right. 
but sometimes we end up there. Or there's kind of a third option, legalism, conformity to culture, or we just ignore it, right? La, 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 la. I'll just pretend it's not there. Do we agree with that, that the church has not been perfect in this? Yeah. And number four, because God designed and created us, and because God designed and created, mar created marriage, it is valuable for us to seriously consider what God's word says about marriage and divorce. Now, I, I use the word consider, I think, on your note sheet. Let's change that. Um, follow. <laughs> because sometimes in today's society, it's easy to say, well, let's hear what God says. Let's consider that and then... I'll decide whether I like it or not. That's not what God calls us to. But doesn't it seem like it would be wise to talk and listen to the one who designed marriage to understand it? So four things. I think that those are valuable to understand up front. Let's look at this scripture. When Jesus had finished saying these things, now let's stop right there. Um, what Jesus has just said, it's always valuable to look at the context of a scripture. What he has just said is that he cares when people stumble or when people sin. He talked about, uh, last week we looked at the parable of the unforgiving servant, this uh, amazing, challenging, comforting story about a master who forgives a huge debt, and then the one who is forgiven is not forgiving. And Jesus says that's not the way it's supposed to be, but he also talked last week about the fact that there are um, times that we need to challenge each other. And we need to wrestle with each other about sin in our lives. So that's what Jesus has been saying. And then it says, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Now, remember the, the crowds were kind of a mixed bag. There were people who were really broken. One of the things that Jesus was confronted with very often was people who said, why do you hang out with people like that? Tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners. Maybe, it, I don't think it's a stretch to say that at some point people might have said to Jesus, and you hang out with divorced people? In fact, we know that's true in John chapter 4. There's this woman who has had multiple husbands. And people are wondering, why is Jesus with people like that? There were sinners. There were religious people. There were people who were sincerely seeking to, tru to get truth. There were people who were just kind of gapers, you know, uh, that's a word that I didn't hear much until I moved to Chicago. And then I would be on the interstate, I'd be on the tri-state especially, and people would say on the radio, oh, there's a gaper's delay, you know, over by O'Hare normally. And it was basically people who were saying, something's going on, I want to watch. Now, let's be honest, how many of us have been gapers at some point in traffic? Oh, let's see. Yeah, me too. Um, but there are gapers, there are people that are confused, there are Pharisees, there are people that are desiring healing, there are people that have been healed. 
I mean, imagine for a moment if you were somebody who had been blind and deaf from birth and you were healed by Jesus, would you just go home and kind of continue? Or would you say, I want to be with this guy? So there's all kinds of people there. Verse 3 says, some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, now again, to test him. Probably a little bit of an adversarial thing going on. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? That's a loaded way to word it, isn't it? They don't even say, are there situations when it's okay to get divorced? They said, you know, can pretty much a guy divorce his wife because he wakes up one morning and says, ah, you don't look like you did when we got married. Um, I don't like the way you're changing over time. Um, and so they ask a question because there were two schools of thought in, about divorce in those days. Um, and this is from Deuteronomy 24. We won't really dig into that much. But basically, um, Deuteronomy 24 says a man can um, divorce his wife because of sexual immorality or even immodesty. Like, it, it seems as if there were people that would say, well... My wife went out in public and I thought she was showing a little too much leg. I divorced thee, I divorced thee, I divorced thee. Wow, that's pretty harsh. On the other hand, there were people that said that basically Deuteronomy 24 says he can divorce her if she becomes displeasing to him. Now, let's flip it around. Wives, has your hu husband ever become displeasing to you? <laughs> you? You remember Tuesday? <laughs> Don't answer that out loud with your wife sitting next to you, Mark. So there were people who said... Can a husband just kind of dispose of his wife because he doesn't like her anymore? Or he doesn't like her today? And Jesus answered. Haven't you read that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female? Now, he goes on and he talks about um, Genesis 2. 1 and 2 and the creation of man and basically the first thing he points out is that God designed and created marriage. He has authority over it. The first thing that Jesus says is this can't be our opinion. We have to give God authority. God designed and created marriage. That's the first thing out of Jesus' mouth. Now, our society doesn't want God to have authority, right? Our society wants to say anybody can make marriage into anything they want it to be. But the Scripture said male and female, and they are united, and the two become one flesh, which matters. We'll talk about that in a minute. And God clearly has an investment in marriage. In fact, it's so easy in most places to get a divorce today that as long as both people agree, basically you can say to your wife one day or say to your husband, I don't want to be married to you. Uh, I don't want to be married to you either. And there's some legal stuff to go through, but... Here's the problem with that. 
Ephesians 5 says that marriage is supposed to be an object lesson of what God's covenant love for his people looks like. Ephesians 5 says the world around us should look at Christian marriage and say that's what love looks like. That's how God loves his church the way that that man loves his wife, the way that she loves him. And if we make it something easy to throw away, something disposable that we don't take seriously, what are we communicating? I mean, it's an object lesson for love. So the first thing that we see in Jesus' response is God designed and created marriage and he values it. It's important. And I think that most people would agree with that. Let's go on. Um, why then, they ask, did Moses command that a man gives his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. And then he says, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife for sexual immor except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Now, there's a lot here to dig into. We're not going to get to it all. But Jesus draws a pretty hard line, right? He says, look, if you divorce your wife, and again, in that situation, in that culture, it didn't really go both ways. A woman could leave her husband, but generally that wouldn't happen. So um, in that situation, Jesus says, except for sexual immorality. Now, that word there for sexual immorality is the Greek word porneia, which can refer to all kinds of sexual sin. But in this case, it seems to be specific when um, that he's saying specifically about adultery. So the second thing that this passage clearly teaches, I think, is that God hates divorce. Now, as soon as I say that, a lot of people in our society will say, what? You're saying that divorce is always wrong? No, that's not what I said. God hates divorce. Malachi 2.16 says that straight up. God hates divorce. Now, why would the Bible say that? Well, several reasons. Number one is his object lesson, marriage is. And God says, I want the world to see what love looks like by looking at marriages. And if you get divorced, what are we telling the world? But it goes on. I mean, how, how many people have you ever met in your life that would say, even if divorce was necessary, maybe there was sexual immorality or there was abandonment. How many people would say, I went through this divorce, my marriage fell apart and we ended up divorced and it was great. The whole process was just a fun thing where the dissolving of our marriage was wonderful and fun and no. And God loves his people. So part of the reason that he hates divorce, I think, is because it hurts. I mean, I remember when our kids were little, we had a pediatrician um, over in um, Flossmore Dr. Room, nicest guy ever. But when Dr. Room gave a shot to my children, I hated him. 
because he was hurting my children. So God hates divorce. In fact, it's clear here that the law of Moses permitted divorce because of hard hearts. In other words, what he's saying there is um, we're broken people. You ever think about that of the wedding? A wedding, a marriage, is always the uniting of two dreadful sinners. Right? Uh, a marriage, when you go to a wedding, the husband, the groom is all handsome and duded up and the wife is looking beautiful and it's beautiful but it's easy to forget that basically those are two broken selfish sinners who have no idea what they're getting into right I've never actually said that straight out in a wedding maybe I should do that sometime um Kenny, if I do your wedding, I want to remind me to say that, okay? Um, so what he's saying is we have hard hearts. We have broken hearts. And divorce is always the result of sin. Now, again, Scripture says there are situations where it's allowed but it's still the result of sin, right? It's the result of selfishness or unfaithfulness or anger or a lot of other stuff. There are situations in which getting divorced is not sinful. But it's still the result of sin. Does that make sense? So... First thing, God designed and created marriage. Second thing, God hates divorce. Third thing that this scripture teaches is that God restricts divorce. God doesn't say, well, you're all broken people, so just, yeah, it's not working. Get a divorce. That's not what he says. He looks at marriage and he says, this is important and I have made you one and I don't want you to throw that away lightly. In fact, it's interesting, there's a subtle change. The Old Testament, um, when they quote it here, they say, Moses commanded a divorce, which actually isn't what he did. But... Jesus is suggesting that when there are circumstances, it's okay, but it's never the best. It, it, it shouldn't be thrown away. In fact, in the Old Testament, you know what the consequences of adultery were? Stoning. That's pretty serious. And Scripture says several times that the adulterous people shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So, God restricts divorce, and there's a lot we should say about that. But the key, I think, is that we need to embrace this, folks, that Marriage is a gift from God. It's a wonderful, beautiful thing. And the scripture says, don't throw that away lightly. Whether we're talking about ourselves or our families or our friends, we need to walk with them. Now, remember that this comes right after the extravagant forgiveness of the previous chapter. Jesus has just told them forgiveness that comes from God is like a servant who is forgiven 
hundreds of millions or even a billion dollars in debt. So Jesus is saying, look, the situation is about grace and forgiveness, and that's the way he approaches it. Now, he mentions um, sexual immorality here. I do want to mention that 1 Corinthians 7 also seems to make a provision for abandonment. If the spouse just leaves, again, is that a good thing? No. That, that's an awful, painful thing. In fact, one of the best ways to think about this, I think, is that when I was working for PASS, Pregnancy Aid South Suburbs, and I was doing um, the sexual abstinence talks, we would do a thing where I thought about doing this, but it sounded painful. Um, we would take a piece of packing tape and we'd stick it on a kid's arm as an object lesson. And we would leave it there and I'd talk for a minute or two and then I'd rip it off. And ideally it was a, a pretty hairy-armed 16-year-old guy who thought he was tough. And he was stinging. And the idea was that's really the way sex, sexual intercourse and also marriage works, that the two become one. There's a bonding. There's a oneness. And when you rip that off, it hurts. So... Before we rip off that tape lightly, we need to ask ourselves, is, is there another option? Now, often there isn't. And please understand, I don't want you or anybody else to feel like, I guess I blew it. Well, we're sinners. And there are situations in which God says, this marriage gift was badly broken. We'll go on. We've got to finish this. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, it is better not to marry. In fact, basically what they say is, well, if it's that hard... I'm going to stay single. And Jesus says, yeah, not everyone can accept this word. And then he says this odd thing. There are those who are eunuchs who are born that way, eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God. He's saying we end up in different situations for different reasons. But the idea, the context there is that Jesus is saying God is in that. Whatever situation you're in, God can work in that. In fact, the best way to say it, and I, I is that God redeems ours. God says, like any sin in our life, God can walk in and we talk to God about it and we say, this is the pain, this is the sin in my life. And God says, I can, I can work in that. God says, I can even use that for the good. Now, we're not going to go to verses 13 through 15, although I think it matters. We'll look at that next week. But I do want to ask, so what? You know, for most of us, this is not a current situation. I think that in the heart of Jesus, we can say three things. Number one, let's be people that comfort those in this. Even if you've been divorced for 20, 30, 40 years, there is 
often pain that wells up. And we need to be people who weep with those who weep. Mourn with those who mourn. And we see Jesus doing that. Walking with sinners, with struggling people. So number one, comfort people. Number two, I want to challenge us to be people who speak truth to people. I mean, honestly, most of us have been in the situation where we had a friend who was maybe considering divorce and we knew that what we kind of needed to do was say, whoa, not so quickly. Sometimes there are times that we need to speak truth to people. And finally, I want to, um, the third application is this. Celebrate God's grace. The fact that God can redeem divorce. That even when there's brokenness, even when there's adultery that leaves a marriage scarred, God says, I can cause all things to work together for the good. We need to be a people that don't define people by what they did, by the choices they made, by the things that life did to them. We need to celebrate that God's grace provides forgiveness and provision And strength. Because that's the way Jesus was. Now I know I've not. Turned over every stone that could be turned over. But. As we move to the table here. I think this is. Appropriate. It might seem odd like. Why would we do this on. Communion Sunday. Well. A couple reasons. One is that that's the next scripture. So that's where God brought us. But also, this is about forgiveness, right? It's about a Savior who loved us in our sin. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Then in the midst of all of that, Jesus said, I love you so much that I will die for you. In fact, I I didn't go there, but there's this amazing book in the Old Testament, the book of Hosea, where God wants to teach his people about faithfulness and unfaithfulness. And so he has his prophet Marry a prostitute. And the point is that God, that that God's people sometimes are unfaithful to him. But God is still faithful to us. It's what the table is about. We give thanks to God the Father that our Savior Jesus Christ before he suffered gave us this memorial of his sacrifice that we might remember him until he comes again. The Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread and when given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. With these words, our God commands all believers to eat this bread and drink this cup in true faith, the confident hope of his return in glory. And in this ritual, our God 
that our sins have been completely that adultery and divorce and anger and disrespect and abuse which was completed on the cross once and for all. And he also paints a picture of the fact that there will come a day when all of that pain and brokenness is healed. And we will be one. I remember talking to a woman who was nearing the end of her life, whose husband had been a difficult, difficult man. And he had passed away, but before he became a believer, uh, before he died, he became a believer. After Honestly, probably 40 years of an unhappy marriage. He was, in the last couple weeks of his life, transformed and made like Jesus. And she said, I don't know for sure whether I will be married to him in heaven. But if I'm going to spend eternity with that man... I'm glad that I'm going to spend it with the man who Jesus made me, not the man that I spent 40 years with. That's what communion celebrates, the fact that Jesus makes us new. We invite all those who are followers of Jesus Christ and who have made a public profession of their faith to join us at the table. We come eagerly and joyfully with assurance of faith, not because we are worthy, but because Christ has made us worthy. Lord, we come to you because we need you. We have all been unfaithful to you. We have all been unfaithful to those around us, Lord. But we come to you with hope and confidence because we need grace in our hour of In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite the elders forward and the uh, worship team is going to lead us in a song. As we come around... Um, as the elders serve, there will be um, a cup with juice and a cup with bread. We ask you to take one of each and then hold those and we will partake together.
as we partake, let's remember with joy that in our lives, which are broken by choice and by nature, that God sets us free and God cleanses us from all of our sin. Take, eat, remember, and believe that the blood, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. Take, drink, remember, and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. Before I close this in prayer. I know that there are those of us in this room that this is a hard topic for. Maybe in our own lives, maybe in the lives of people around us, but I want to remind you that the blood of Jesus is enough. That whatever you've done, whatever's been done to you, the blood of Jesus is enough. Whatever you are going to face, the blood of Jesus is enough. And the blood of Jesus also calls us to let the that the blood of Jesus is enough. Burning hearts, we thank you, Father, for making Christ known to us in the breaking of the bread and the pouring out of the fruit of the vine. We ask that this meal would enable us to increase in faith, persevere in hope, and grow in love. May this witness to Christ draw others to him. Lord, we pray that you would set our hearts free to worship, set our voices free to speak and sing of you, and set our lives free that we might live in the glory and grace of our Lord. To the glory of your name, amen. Receive. you please stand? Let's sing one more time together.
peace under the blood of Jesus. Amen.